afternoon. Hello, my name is Ed. I am a staff scientist here and leader of a lot of our educational outreach programs here at Clemson. Welcome to the 2019 Winter EM course. Take a little bit of reading for Take that back down a little bit. Okay. So what we're going to do today is introduce you to the course and give you an outlay of EM. This is the 14th year we've had the EM course. Okay, how about that? Okay, no more reverb. So the main reason why a lot of people are here is Crowley EM is what we're focused on, has been on the rise for the past few years as they acknowledge not only for its single particle techniques, but what in the future on the horizon EM might be able to bring to bear on a lot of the biotechnological, biomedical research. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go over the course and logistics. Uh, we have a couple of people reloading in. Uh, this is the first year we're really trying to make an effort to see if people out of state can take this course. I'll give you an introduction to EM, and of the people who are here, we'll give you a short tour of the EM facility because uh, you won't be able to see all the areas of the lab outside within the context. Okay, so the main place that will post all the lectures uh, and give you up-to-date information is our website. All of you should have received an email to register, and from this day forward, we're going to use that to curate a mailing list. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, please see one of us. So my name again is Ed. I'm the course leader. I'm joined with a lot of people who's in presence right now with Laura in the back, and she'll help manage the classroom and make sure that everything's running smoothly, and be in contact with a couple of people that are doing remote taking the course remotely. We have two TAs, which aren't, they aren't here right now. Uh, it's still vacation time. We have Yangzi and Mike, both of them are in Columbia. And in terms of people taking the course for credit, you can also uh, talk to them. They might be able to point you to the registrar because in addition to registering with us, you have to register with your home institution's registrar. Okay, I talked about the email list. Something that our TAs will also give out is a course handbook, and they'll detail a little bit more, especially for those who can for credit. And I will preface that we are an active research facility. There are certain public areas. This is a public area. And downstairs, when I give you the tour, I'll show you a couple other public areas. Um, and the purpose of giving the tour is we'll go into the areas of active research where normally you wouldn't be able to just trounce around. And in particular, right behind us is the NMR facility. So that's an area we want to uh, really see or clear up. Okay. For all our lectures, we're going to be recording them, and we'll be putting them on our YouTube page. And the idea is that in the public domain, we can put a lot of information out there. So if you don't take that most accurate notes, you can always go back and look at that. And again, with this and the lecture notes that are posted up, hopefully you'll have a good resource. So in terms of a textbook, we don't have a textbook per se. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be relying heavily on Grant Jensen's lectures. And we, for the first part of it, we'll do a little bit of a reverse classroom, where the assumption is that you'll watch Grant Jensen's lectures. And then when you come into the class, we can augment that. As we go through the semester, there'll be certain topics that aren't uh, really covered. And we'll go into a lot more detail. And we'll bring in some experts from the New York area that practice these techniques day in, day out. And so you can have more value added because you can talk to an expert, see how they're using this particular technology in their research, and communicate with them. Okay. But the main purpose of showing you this, and there are other courses online, is that they do things wonderfully. And something that's really useful that they're online, you can pause, rewind, play them in half x or 3x, depending on what you want to do, and, and really make use of the resource because we want you to learn these techniques. The idea is that so if I say things once and you just want to become an expert. No, the hope would be that we can mentor you through this and then that you would be able to really learn and become an expert, at least on the theory side for EM. There would be certain opportunities where we do some amount of practicals and hopefully we can augment that as much as possible. So moving forward, so then how the class will work, we will have our lectures primarily in this seminar room if the class size reduces then we might go to a little bit more of a cozier venue downstairs, and I'll show you that uh, in a tour. Wednesdays for the first month will be lectures, but after that first month, they'll become practicals or journal club. And that's a recitation schedule there. That's still a little fluid based upon what our TAs have uh, worked out for practicals. We might change that schedule a little bit between 
what is actually a practical versus a journal club. Okay. For those taking this course for credit, the recitation will count half your grade attendance for 10%, and then the practical worksheets uh, will make up 40%, four and four. Okay, so now in terms of the class, we've broken down the class to several different, I have to talk up, okay. We've broken down the class to several different sections. The first section, this first month of January, will be the EM Fundamentals. Then we'll go on to Tomography, single particle, 2D crystallography, and then section five is the most interesting section I see in the sense that it's not necessarily covered in any of the online courses. And this is going to be fluid, and so if during the uh, course you see that there's certain topics that you would like to talk more about, we can augment and we can adapt for that. In terms of the first month, what the EM fundamentals mean is, the hope would be this first month gives you what classically you would think you would need to learn the basics of the theory of gravity. Wednesday, we have Angie Chen, who's going to talk about the anatomy of the microscope. So that's our main tool. So I want to preface that when you, after this lecture on four, the assumption is that you really have watched branch of these lectures. And Angie talked to me earlier today. She's quite adamant. If you're not invested in learning, don't even show up for the class, because she'll expect that you've watched the lecture and that you know a few things. For example, you might be interested in EM. Have you gone to your local EM facility and know what microscope you have? Is it an 80 kV microscope, 120 kV microscope? What's your high tension? What's your electron source? What's the camera associated with that? And I'm prompting you that if, if you don't know the answers of, to these questions, find out before Wednesday. Otherwise, it'll be a very interesting lecture. Uh, maybe not so much for you, but we'll find out. Uh, then the following week, we're going to go into a little bit more about, uh, about how we have to handle samples. And we'll try to give you a practical on making some short films and actually looking for and uh, trying to work with what we use day in, day out for records of EM. And then winding out the session, what, what structural biology course would be for us if we don't go over Fourier transforms and image formation? And this will be more towards the bent of not to say if you take an extra crystallography, you've gone some of that, but this is more towards optics and physics and what's really crucial and really understanding what a good image is and how we feed that forward because this foundation will be assumed when carried forward to the next modalities of EM will assume that you have these basics and we can move on to the actual modality. And what are those modalities? The first modality we'll be really interested in is tomography. Way Dye from Rutgers is going to give us an introduction. And we'll follow it by uh, Bill Rice, staff scientist here on Fit SEM. So this is also considered a tomography technique, but that's where you're slicing and viewing through a volume. You can use that to do reconstructions as well as work as a sample prep chamber for a lot of what Alex Noble uh, we'll be talking about cryo applications and subtomogram averaging for tomography. After that section is completed, we'll move on to the bread and butter of what a lot of people have been doing here at the center, single particle analysis. The kickoff for that will be Jochen Frank introducing the technique of single particle. And then we'll go into some more of the challenges. Reza Kaya and Amade de George from CUNY will be talking about data analysis. And then we'll wind up with Rich Height from Sloan Kettering talking about how do you interpret EMAPs and the limitations of single particle and how we can extend that. The third modality of EM that a lot of people use is crystallography. And that will be started off with a technique that's really grown in popularity and flavor right now, microED, because of its potential applications. Not too many people do true crystallography, but that's still quite important in, in the sense that the very first near atomic reconstruction by EM really came from crystallography, from 2D crystals. Then we'll go over to a particular application of crystallography, and that's helical reconstructions. Greg Lucian from Rockefeller will introduce that technique, and it'll be followed on Fernando Sosa from Einstein. And that will be the three main modalities of EM that people consider. That is tomography, single particle analysis, and crystallography. After that, we'll get into new frontiers. And then this is something that's quite fluid. Validation is a large topic. So how do you know you have a reconstruction that's useful, and how much can you interpret from that? Tom from Rockefeller is going to talk a little bit on validation methods. Then we'll follow up by Kathy Lawson from the EMDD talking about that resource itself. 
is what's ending up happening, just like the PDD, you deposit a lot of structures. In. So now there's something known as the EM data bank, and we have all these EM structures. Well, how do you use that resource? Given that the, the, the validation methods have changed over time, how much can you just download an app and trust it as it is, or how much interpretation do you have to do with that? Is there a cross in annotation, as in atomic models associated with that? How much can you use that? So this is a lot about that and how the field has been pushing a lot of validation challenges to make things a little bit more streamlined. So you can open a paper, read that nice paper, go to these publicly available databases, and you know, look at the raw data itself. And if you want to, you can actually process it again. From there, we'll go on to two different aspects of interpreting maps. Yara Bada from NYU is going to talk about how do you interpret moderate resolution maps and what moderate resolution changes. Uh, and then Ali Clark from Columbia is going to talk about when you have near atomic maps, how you can actually start doing what a lot of the crystallographers do and they make an atomic model of that. So that rounds out the EM challenges in the new frontier section. And so what, what I really want to point out is there are a whole wealth of instructors, and these are really experts in the field. And so the, the hope is you come to the lecture prepared. If you watch Brandon Jensen's lecture, that gives you a foundation, such that when you come here, you can interact with these people, and then you can gain a little bit more from their experience. And that's really the hope, that it's interactive, there's a lot of value added, and then that, that really pushes towards you towards your own research, and you can really feed forward these techniques. Okay. So that's really a little bit about the course. Are there any questions about how the course is laid out, our structure, anything you want to add? Okay, has everyone heard of Grand Chancellor's lectures? Right, so uh, really, really want to point out, such that you're prepared, do you watch them? Um, they're usually matched, so the, the way the course is set up, it's usually matched that a particular section of Grand Chancellor's lectures should be watched right before. So there's a Grand Chancellor lecture on the anatomy of the microscope. Obviously, you watched that before. Uh, Wednesday, right? And then when you get to the smart sections sections, for, or for your transforms later this month, you definitely want to watch out ahead because that's going to be a lot more easier to digest. So it's not to say that you have to be an expert coming in, but then if you have some foundational knowledge ahead of that, it'll make the class more of a discussion. And the hope would be, we already know the concepts. The hope would be that you too will also know the concepts and we'll help you as much as we can. Okay? So now let's introduce Crowley and Proper. So this is something that's a little bit more exciting for me, the logistics are over. What is cryo-EM? And I think really while we, we sit in the world and we try to extend ourselves and we always have the human nature of trying to see more, and that's either whether you look through a microscope and see the stars, or you look through a microscope and see the atoms of our world, to your personal preference, which you prefer. For me, I think that looking and understanding biomedical research, looking at the atoms that focus on biology, really excites me more. And that's really what a lot of structural biology is focused on, a lot of what we'll be talking about during the EM. And so the hope really is that we can look at biology. And what does that actually mean? What is that scale of biology? Well, EM, uh, by definition, uses a microscope, and it's an electron microscope. And with our tool, we can just change the magnification, and we can really view different parts of biology. And the, this slide's not meant to say, say that EM does everything, X-ray only has a limited range. What this says is that EM has the opportunity to access several different size ranges, and complementary to that, we can augment and cross-validate with other techniques. And I want to really underscore that that's really important in the sense that no one technique right now is sufficient alone. So we have to really make use of several different modality several different techniques to really push the boundary and really understand things. So with that, what can we really do today? I think why people are so excited about EM is that we can do is within a day, we can put a sample into the microscope and get near atomic resolution. And that really means that we can get you know, close to two entrants or even beat that two entrant barrier within a half day of data collection. And what is that timeline really? So if you start off with a tube where you really understand the biochemistry, you still have to do a couple of steps to really get the sample ready for, for single particle analysis. But with good hands and uh, a lot of the streamlining that's going on, 
we can do simple biochemistry techniques and get into the microscope within a couple of hours and start collecting really good data and use a lot of technologies that have come along the way and push the revolution, understand heterogeneity, understand underlying biology, and get near atomic resolutions within that time frame. And this is quite routine. We can do that for a wide variety of proteins. And this is quite exciting because what now we can do is we can extend it beyond very well-behaved proteins and push the envelope and look at things that are heterogeneous, look at multiple samples on our grid, really try to understand underlying biology because what we can do is we can really see where biochemistry happens. Because if you're starting to push revolution, we're starting to do this quite routinely, we can actually get things that are highly useful to understand biomedical research. And that has been highlighted within the past couple of years. When people talk about cryo-EM, they're really referring to single particle cryo-EM. And there's more on the horizon, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. But Looking at biology, you might see the scale bar if you really understand that breadth that EM is accessing for you. We're very interested in cells. Cells are on the size of microns, even uh, submicrons. And then, what in relation to that, what are we looking at? We're looking at proteins and viruses and DNA and all that. And then we're going to the nanometer, we're going to sub nanometer in terms of revolution, we're going towards atomic revolution. And so if you think of that, EM is a very powerful technique in being able to uncover what we can. We can't really see what it is, but it's accessible with a wavelength of a couple of picometers coming from our microscope. And so how do we really go about this and how do we do this when we have our sample? You know, biology is a lot more fluid than we think about that. There's a lot more going on. And we have worked out for the years different ways of treating our sample and really capturing the underlying biology. So realistically, when we have, uh, let's say, a transmission electron microscope, you can think of it as an inverted microscope. And so what we're doing is we're trying to get a very nice sample that we can image through. And then what we would do in the case of single particle analysis, is we collect a lot of images. Here's an example of a typical single particle cryo image. And really what that image is is projections of our three-dimensional object. And how we get that three-dimensional object is challenging, mainly due to the fact that um, our electron beam is very you know, radiation damaging. And so we have to do a lot. A lot has come along the way to really push the technology. Because if you look at a sample, the more and more we look at it, the more damage we may cause on it. So there are a lot of things that we've done to attenuate that. And uh, that can to be handled by handling and software. But now we have all these projection images. What we can do is we can take them, we can align them, and we can average them. And something that you might have seen is the particular image is quite noisy. And part of that comes from the radiation damage I was talking about. And we want to limit our dose. And that's how we can really push the resolution. Also, from this, what we see is by the power of averaging, we get a lot more signal for noise. And what we can do is we have really complete views, we can reconstruct that the whole three-dimensional model. And then that model was really useful for us to interpret and build upon, and then we can really understand underlying biology. And so you can get a gallery of a whole wide variety of sizes and get all the components in there. And so that's really what I was talking about biology and how EM, that technology, can really push biomedical research, is we can start seeing a lot of biology, we can start understanding the mechanism of things. So, how is this really being done? How, what are the tools of the trade that we use? We use typically a transmission electron microscope that's in the middle, or a standing electron microscope on the, the far right. And a TEM is really similar to what I'm showing you here on, on the far left here, and that's just like an inverted microscope. So if you are familiar with your inverted microscope biology, you already know a lot about a TEM. The SEM we'll, we'll talk a little about, but then that's really how it's an electron microscope. It's a different method of imaging. It's like a scanning on the CRT screen, but that allows us to look at a different size range. We can look at organisms and cells more in the SEM, and then with the TEM we can look at you know, cells, organelles, all the way down to you know, components of a cell. 
something that is really useful in how we've been pushing that. One is our microscope has been getting better. And the main thing is if you just have a normal light microscope, usually what you do is you put your sample on the stage and you take an image and you see that. And when you want to take an image of something different, you move your stage. But what we've been able to do is really try to increase throughput by the lens system on our microscope such that you can put a sample on the stage and you can use the microscope itself to look at greater and greater regions. And that allows us to do more. That really shrinks the time to collect complete data sets. And what we can do is, within a day, really capture quite a bit of biology. Right. So I've talked a little bit about the microscope. Something else that has come along the way to really push the resolution are our camera system. Because in the end, we are dealing with images, and we have to interpret the images. And uh, right now, what we have are not, let's say, what we used to have were CCDs, where we had to use a scintillator that coupled the fiber optics. We have CMOS detectors that directly detect electrons. And not only that, they collect movies, in a sense. They have really, really fast frame rates, and we can use motion correction to gain that. So not only do we have greater sensitivity uh, to the protein molecules or the molecules we're interested in, but we can also do things, for example, from processing this image, take many images and align them and gain that more resolution. So that's another advance. One advance I was talking about with the microscope, another advance are detectors. And something else that's been really pushing forward is also the processing programs we've been using to do this process. So a lot of threefold in terms of developments are really pushing. So now what's on the horizon for tomorrow? I've been talking about what we can do today, what we can do right now. So what we're going to be doing in the future is that samples are precious. So imagine you can use less and less of your sample. Instead of using you know, three microliters, imagine you can only use three picoliters of your sample. And so then you can really access things that are precious. So unless you're dealing with patient samples, you can't just say, I just want a few more patients, so I have some more samples. And the idea would be, there are technologies on the horizon that make sample preparation a little bit more reproducible, uh, reduce the volumes of use, and really push the technique forward in that you have more than one sample on a, on a particular grid. Okay, and something that I've been talking about a lot is the molecular structure. Now let's go into the cell. What more exciting things for a biologist or a cell biologist to say? I can get near atomic resolution in the cell type, in the patient cell type that I'm really curious about. And we've been really pushing that here, and a lot of places have been pushing that. And the point being is that we want to see systems level. We want to connect that near atomic level to cellular biology. A lot of people traditionally have been doing chlorophyll microscopy. But you can bring cryo techniques towards it. The only catch is the cell is several microns. The free mean half of a TEM typically is on the order of several hundred nanometers, or maybe you know, close to a micron. So we have to thin the cell a little bit before we really access certain areas. But that's part of the next chapter. So part of the next chapter is better handle on samples, better accessing greater swaths of biology. And the next thing is therapeutics. So something that's really exciting is that what we can do is within a half an hour, we can get you a structure of a chemical and using the electron microscope. And we can even put multiple ones on a grid and get you that. So now imagine all these things on a horizon. We can understand the therapeutic. We can understand the mechanism of action, not only at an atomic level, but in context of the cell. And we can do it quite rapidly, and we need very little sample. And so that's really where the future of the end is being pushed. And the hope would be, that going through this course, that we set you up such that you can be where the end will be. Okay, so then I'm going to wind up pretty soon, but we're going to, for those here, we're going to give a tour of the Sun's Electron Microscopy Center and the New York Structural Biology Center, and I'll just preface, you've all found the place because you're here. Um, I will point out that we do more than the EM course. Up and coming, we'll have a few more practicals. We have a processing practical coming up in a month, and that's going to be called an Appian Workshop. And for those that are not users of the facility, I'll pitch that. Uh, please do see us, and if you want to make use of the resources here, we can talk to you about that. And one of the main resources here are the people. And so I pointed out, if you look on the far right, uh, that's who I am. That's Laura, Young, Lee, and Mike. 
So these are your resources here for the course to really help you and orient you and make sure that you don't slip through the cracks. And make sure that all the concepts that we're going over are really integrated. And the last thing I'll mention is that something that's really exciting towards access and really what's happening in the developing the field is that there are these called national centers. Just like what happened to the beam lines, uh, the government has funded a lot of synchrotrons. So that has lowered the barriers for access for researchers not to have everything in their home institution. In your home lab, you don't have to have a well, full toolkit. But there are three new national centers. The original uh, center was the National uh, Cryogen Facility at NCI. There's NCCAF here. Also, up in Portland, there's PNCC. And then at SLAC, there's SCCT. So look out for these centers coming in. So do you have any questions? Otherwise, we can go for a bit of a tour. Did anyone from online it, it was able to actually contact and log on? OK, perfect. So we'll have to do a follow-up with that. I think yes. Like, so when you're showing the protein, when it, you take like an image of it, and then mm -hmm. you have an image of it that's burnt, right. uh, what is the time scale or something like that? So the time scale is more of the flux. So the difference between the first image and, and the other image was 20 electrons per action squared versus 250 electrons per action squared. So like 10 volts. And so if, if we were running at I don't know, like 10 electrons per action squared per second, then that would be you know a good what 25 second exposure. Okay. And my next question is, what do you think like between the hardware of like because a lot has developed in the last five ten years. Right. The hardware from the cameras to better microscopes, the algorithms from the software getting faster, the computational resources are getting. The major thing, the biggest advancement was oh, camera, right. because you can put a camera on an old microscope and immediately extend resolution. Then the next thing would be programs, computation, algorithms. We have more sophisticated algorithms to make use of low disk images. And then the third would be the microscope itself, because that gives you more throughput and ease of use. But I would take that order. That's my personal order. Camera um, algorithm instead of the microscope. Right, because you can put a new camera on an old microscope and all of a sudden act as a different resolution range. Programs will be able to help you process things which you haven't been able to process. And then having a better microscope just makes everything easier. So you can do it within a day versus a week. Or you don't have to hire five different people to stay up all night and go through. Sure. That's what we used to do in the old days. Okay, so I'm going to give those. How many are actually interested in that tour? OK, great. So then I'll go through the tour. We'll start up, up here in the NMR area. So we're going to go down, and we're going to go into the sense area proper. And then for those online, we're done. You can leave your stuff here, mainly due to the fact that where we're going to go to, uh, there will be some magnetic fields. So we have the room for, for the power. So there's no reason that.